Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Tyler DiOrio. I'm a fifth year PhD student at Purdue University. And today I'll just share a little bit about one of my projects. This one's specifically dealing with Alzheimer's disease and some MRI based metrics. So to give you the nice lengthy title here, it's assessing patient specific cardiac driven brain motion, MRI based biomarkers of white matter lesion formation. Let's see if we get the slides. Cool. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. It affects over 6 million Americans and is projected to increase to over 13 million Americans by the year 2050. And there's currently no cure for disease with around a third of senior citizens dying of Alzheimer's disease or some other type of dementia. And what's interesting is that despite all the efforts in the Alzheimer's field and the massive funding, there's really been no great treatment. So not only can we not treat the disease, but even slowing progression is not always uh, done properly by these drugs. So, um, oops, thought I heard something in the chat here. Cool. Yeah. So what we're trying to do now in the field is to move towards early detection, where instead of treating the disease before it reaches this irreversible phase, we're trying to get it before it reaches that because we found out it's actually a very progressive disease. So. There's currently clinical guidelines that exist for Alzheimer's disease that are set forth by the U.S. National Institute on Aging and Alzheimer's. And these first came about in 1984. And the, the clinical requirements were very basic. It just had to deal with some type of memory co or cognitive change. And then upon autopsy, they would commonly find plaques, which we now know are either um, amyloid beta or tau tangles. But there was a significant revision done to these guidelines in 2011, where they added a lot more granularity so now there's the amnestic or non-amnestic mild cognitive impairment, which is a more uh, discreet form of dementia, kind of like an earlier stage. And there's also many more distinguishing features. So I won't go through them all, but the important ones to look at and uh, should animate in here is that now we know vascular dementia, it plays a very critical role in Alzheimer's disease. And vascular dementia basically says that there's some relation uh, of the blood vessels to the degradation of the brain tissue and the loss of cognitive abilities. And what's cool is now we do a lot more data on these individuals and specifically use MRI. And MRI can give us a ton of different information about the structural scale, the microstructural scale, and then even some motion, which I'll talk about in a bit. But the key thing here is that this 2011 revision really highlighted that Alzheimer's disease is a progressive disorder, starting in midlife around ages 46 to 60 and progressing over 15 to 25 years to late life where it actually causes these symptoms. So the hope is maybe we can catch it, you know, quite a bit earlier. The traditional hypothesis of how um, dementia kind of forms and specifically Alzheimer's disease focuses on the amyloid cascade model. This is the predominant theory since around the 1990s, and it basically puts amyloid beta as the trigger threshold driver or irrelevant component of the whole amyloid beta cascade. And so that may not, might not make a lot of sense, but the idea there is that amyloid can tend to aggregate due to these precursor proteins. And when it aggregates, it gets deposited into the brain tissue where it ultimately causes neuronal dysfunction and death. And so it's not debated widely that amyloid beta causes death to the brain tissue. That's very widely established, but it's not so clear why it aggregates in the first place. So there's been a recent theory called vascular dysfunction, which has been rising since around the mid 2010s. And this theory puts the blood vessels as the origin of this disease state. So what this means is the different things that can happen to the blood flow in the brain and the homeostasis, whether it be through the blood brain barrier, decreases in cerebral blood flow or inflammation, all of these individual factors are what actually may cause the amyloid beta to aggregate in the first place, kind of initiating this cascade. And so what this looks like is if you have risk factors like high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, diabetes, or obesity, you have a propensity for all of these different blood um, related components to be altered. So if you follow down the left side of this flow chart, injury to the blood brain barrier decreases your ability to naturally clear amyloid beta that this produced constantly. And if you're not able to clear it as much, since your blood brain barrier is injured, you'll tend to accumulate it, which would kill the neurons. Also, if you have decreases in cerebral blood flow, then you're not getting enough oxygen to the brain and the typoxic state can cause increased production of amyloid beta which also would then cause this injury to the neurons. So it's just kind of like saying, why is this happening in the first place? Maybe it actually has to do with some of the mechanical components of the brain, these blood vessels. So before I go too deep into my research, you don't really need to know a ton of anatomy, but there's three relevant features of the brain. 
Number one is the gray matter, which is this very thin, dark structure on the outside of the cortical surface of the brain. Two is the white matter, which is basically just the bulk of the actual brain tissue, this lighter component. And then the third are these cerebral spinal fluid filled ventricles. They have a very unique shape, which is shown in this animated GIF here on the right. It's kind of like a ram skull. It's a very particular geometry and they're kind of connected and filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And there's a, a series of plexes of arteries that kind of produce the cerebral spinal fluid within this entire structure. But no one particularly knows why it's that shape or its exact function. So it's somewhat of a mystery in the field of bio, uh, biomedical engineering. So when you have Alzheimer's disease, you tend to have some physiological or um, physically visible signs of damage on the brain. And these are termed white matter hyperintensities for their bright appearance on T2 MRI. And so that's what this right figure is showing is all of these individual bright spots, like this thin halo, these deeper lesions, these are all actually damaged to brain tissue. There's a lot of debate about what they could be, but widely agreed upon that they have some relation to the vasculature. And so they, they vary dramatically in their depth into the tissue and also their damage to the brain. But the ones that I deal with specifically in my study is this very thin grade one physica scale, which is the most minor form of damage to the brain. And you can see it progresses dramatically as you get to grade three, where it's this very deep kind of all the way through uh, the white matter. But what's interesting about these lesions is they're not just physical signs of damage. They may actually be predictors. There was a study that showed that your increased amount of white matter lesions was a better predictor of preclinical Alzheimer's disease than all of the traditional neuropsychiatric tests. So just looking at these lesions in the brain is actually better than seeing how the person is functioning in real life, which is crazy. And then further, not even just if you have these lesions or if you don't have it, they actually showed that if you have an increased amount of these lesion volume, it's predictive of how you will do cognitively and then even in mortality. So this is ultimately kind of related to the blood vessels again, because we know that these white matter lesions are uh, typically caused by vascular deficits and degeneration, but they're also predicted very well by the pulse wave velocity. And so not many people may have heard of pulse wave velocity, but essentially it's the speed at which the mechanical wave is propagated through the arteries in your body. So every time your heart beats, it shoots a bunch of fluid through the arteries, but it also shoots a sound wave, like a mechanical wave through the wall of the arteries. And this mechanical wave goes all throughout the body to the legs, fingers, and also brain. But if you look at the equation for pulse wave velocity, it has this E term right here. And this E is the stiffness of the medium in which the wave is traveling. So in the case of the arteries, this E is referring to the stiffness of the arterial wall, which we know when you age tends to stiffen. Arterial stiffening occurs across a wide range of, you know, healthy aging, but then also cardiovascular diseases, we know it's related to Alzheimer's. And what we also know is that if this pulse wave changes, it may also change the way your brain moves because the brain is driven by this spatiotemporal pulse wave. So this plot here is showing is the difference between a 25 year old and a 75 year old. You're seeing the pressure wave at equal parts on the cardiac cycle at P1A and P2A and how different the pressures can be in this location across just the difference in age. And so this 10% difference of 10 millimeters mercury is very dramatic in the cardiac cycle and especially for its temporal behavior, which is on this third axis here. So again, too, like since you have this pulse wave traveling all throughout the body and the brain, it has some degree of energy delivered to a system. So in the brain, it's a very passive organ. It doesn't have its own engine, kind of like the chest has the heart and the lungs. The brain has none of that. It's just a passive organ. But when you have this influx of blood, something really cool happens. You actually have your brain start to pump kind of like a piston up and down over each cardiac cycle. So every time this GIF repeats here, it's a different cardiac cycle. And what you're seeing on the difference in the left and the right, the left is the in vivo, like realistic motion of the brain. And the right is the exaggerated version. This is quantified directly from an individual. And it's difficult to appreciate on the, like, you know, the in vivo scale, but if you amplify it, you can really appreciate how different the brain moves at the level of the brainstem versus something a little deeper into the brain. So more about the mechanics too. It's, it's not like we just think these mechanics may do stuff and they seem to move around on MRI. They actually really matter for the cells. The mechanical properties of cells regulate all kinds of functional behavior, and they can lead to programmed cell death, regeneration, pathogenesis. And you have neurons and glial cells that specifically look for these forces in their environment and translate them into biochemical signals. So therefore, if you have alterations in your mechanical environment, you know, when you have this altered motion, for example, it can trigger pathology in these cells. 
And it's also shown too, that your brain tends to soften over time. And in Alzheimer's disease specifically too, this can cause uh, deficits with synaptic regeneration just because of the stiffness of the brain tissue. And just one step farther too, the degree at which the brain degrades, if you were to look at an MRI and kind of measure the volume, it decreases by about 23 or 0.23% per year in terms of its volume on the growth scale. But if you zoom into the viscoelasticity, a material property of the brain, you can see that that scale of the brain actually degrades three times faster than the gross tissue scale. So this is saying that if you look at the mechanics and the deep properties of the brain, you can get way more information about the future tendencies of the brain than if you were to just look totally at the uh, macro scale. So the whole hypothesis of my research here is that we think underlying damage to the brain may not be immediately visible on MRI, but may be predictive of neurodegeneration and revealed by the biomechanics. So this analogy may or may not hit, but we'll try it. But it's very similar to like going to the grocery store and trying to get an avocado for, you know, some kind of guacamole you're going to make two days later. What you do is you go and you squeeze the avocado, you apply a mechanical force to it, and it will deform proportional to its material properties, which vary over time. And the degree at which it deforms will give you information about its future tendencies. Will it ripen tomorrow or in three days, or is it already too ripe? It's the same thing with the brain. Is it going to form lesions? Does it already have lesions? And how will it do in the future? So just to summarize the whole research gap, we want to really look at the biomechanical uh, contributions to lesion formation, and then use only MRI derived metrics to stratify patient specific risk. And the idea for the MRI is that it's a clinically available tool. So if we're able to do it with just this one tool, then we have a higher chance of getting this into the clinic to actually help people. So a couple of years back, we applied for an NIH R21 grant, which is a, like a middle-sized grant to study 50 total subjects. And we were lucky enough to receive that grant. So we started scanning these patients and what we're shooting for is about 20 males and 30 females, all above the L age of 60. And they all have that similar physicus grade one uh, level of white matter lesions. And we'll be following them for two years. So we'll do a baseline study now, and then a two year follow-up to see how their mental state and their brain mechanics have changed. And we'll get a bunch of other information about their amyloid and tau burdens as well. So across these individuals, right now we don't have those ready, that data. So we have a test group of about seven subjects who are middle-aged and we have no health history. So all the stuff I'll show on screen in the future is just kind of like preliminary results for the method. But on these patients, what we have is a T1 and a T2 image. So these are just how the brain looks with different contrasts for different types of materials. They highlight different stuff in the brain. And then we also have a CNA imaging, which has some velocity information kind of encoded. This is where we actually get the motion of the brain from that CNA image. Now, the University of Washington, uh, there's a group by Dr. Mamet Kurt, Kurt, who do a lot of MRI processing. They're world leaders in MRI processing, and they developed this really interesting method where you can use the steerable pyramids to decompose the MRI images from the CNA scans into their different components, and then ultimately back out displacement fields where they look at across each time frame of the MRI they can calculate how much the brain has moved in between individual frames. And from that calculation, they can actually get out an entire displacement field that's resolved over one cardiac cycle, where they basically say over n steps through the cardiac cycle, we know the brain has moved sequentially in these exact amounts. They quantify it really, really nicely. And along the way too, they do a lot of nice filtering to reduce the noise. And the only thing about this is that it amplifies the data a little bit. So instead of having real life coordinates or, you know, it, it's a bit dramatized, the displacement field. So when we do our processing, we just have to account for that. But the method is incredible. So what our actual data looks like is we have our T1 scan, which is on the left here, and our CNA MRI scan on the right. And with the T1, we follow a typical MRI image processing where we do some bias correction to assess some of the errors from the MRI imaging. Then we do a brain extraction where we remove the skull because it's not really of interest to us. We're just focusing on the brain. And then we do an automated tissue classification where we automatically split the brain up into white matter, gray matter, and CSF. So CSF is red in this, blue is the white matter, and green is the gray matter. Then once we have these tissue classifications, we know exactly which locations on the MRI are each tissue type. We can overlay that segmentation on top of a displacement field. And now we have information that says we know exactly what displacement is related to every single material type over the entire cardiac cycle. So we know exactly what parts of the brain are doing exactly what motion. 
Then we can do a little bit of computational optimizing, where since we don't really need anything outside the brain, we can kind of just trim it away to the exact volume, and this speeds us up quite a bit. And then we have to address the fact that the data has been amplified. So we simply look to the literature and downscale to rough in vivo coordinates based on some literature values. And this is a step where we lose quite a bit of patient specificity, but for the sake of this initial methods development, it's kind of, you know, an okay assumption. So this is an example of a really nice displacement field where you can see it's like almost symmetric across the brain and red to blue is just showing you different, um, different directions of displacement. And this is X is anterior to posterior, Y is superior to inferior, and Z is right to left. So these are all different, like, you know, orthogonal vectors of displacement. And we have these resolved in every patient throughout time. So what we could do is use some nice finite strain math to say, if we have this displacement field and we know these mechanics, we can back out the strain. And the strain is a more mechanical quantity in that it tells you it's like percent change or stretching of the material over an individual step. And so we could split this up into gray matter, white matter, or the combination of both. And now you have some new unique information that's not present in the displacement because you can see they're very spatially different. We can also go one step farther. We can use an approximation of the actual brain material type. So this law here is an isotropic mooney rivlin law. It just basically says that the brain uh, in one particular region behaves all the same, and it has some hyperelastic parts and some viscoelastic parts. And so from this, we could turn the strain into stress. And stress is the actual force per area experienced by every single little location on each of these brain types. So then if you look at all three of these together, you can see that they're not really identical. There's actually some individual information that can be gleaned from all of these. They're not totally dependent variables. So we actually can get, you know, three new maps of biomechanics directly from MRI. But we don't want to just have this for the three gross tissue types. We actually want to get uh, drive down like a little deeper. So this really awesome lab uh, puts, put this GitHub, uh, yeah, put this GitHub algorithm up. And it basically is a machine learning algorithm that could take a T1 image and process it automatically through and calculate the 133 different regions of the brain. So now we could take our image and instead of just using three tissue types, like white matter, gray matter, CSF, and we could split it across every functional region of the brain. And so all these different colors represent a different segmentation or portion of the brain. And it goes so far even to split up the individual ventricles, which is, I thought was incredible. So what we did in its early mock-up is we said, what would it look like if I were to take each of these different biomechanical fields and overlay them onto each of these functional areas? Then for example, we could say, what are the regions that are typically affected by Alzheimer's disease? And so these uh, group here from the right caudate to the left thalamus proper are all regions that are typically affected by Alzheimer's disease. And so this is just a mock-up of results since we don't quite have our patient set yet but it, it becomes very easy to stratify it per disease type where you can kind of look at the important functional regions of the brain to see how each of these biomechanical properties have changed. So now we've really driven down and said that we can quantify per functional region for any given biomechanics directly from MRI, which is pretty awesome. So we ran into a lot of issues, like I said, with um, trying to get our individual patient data. There were some delays with COVID and for funding. So on this initial patient set, all the results shown are primarily just methods development. But what we were able to accomplish is this semi-automated pipeline to go directly from MRI all the way to patient-specific biomechanics. And so what we're working on now is trying to compare these biomechanics, which is shown, for example, in this color map here, to some of the structural information. Because we also know exactly where these patients will have their lesions. And we have this very interesting diffusion tensor imaging from MRI. This gives you microstructural information about the integrity of the very tiny micro scale of the brain. So we could see even deeper how the brain may be impaired at a very tiny scale. And the idea is that we could take all of these different properties and kind of overlay them to get one map that shows where these metrics are uh, co-locally degraded so that we can say, you know, hey, maybe these three metrics when they overlap are actually really predictive of Alzheimer's. And if we have our cognitive outcomes from the two-year follow-up, it should be very nice to kind of compare these biomechanics to exactly the cognitive deficits that occur. So there's a couple of difficulties, like in the study, I mentioned this already, but the downscaling of displacement, kind of a big one because you lose a lot of patient specificity. Um, my brain doesn't move exactly the same way your brain may move, and especially not over one cardiac cycle. So ultimately it'll be really important for us to find a way to actually downscale to the in vivo coordinates of any given individual. But there are groups that are working on machine learning algorithms to do this automatically. So the hope is that this will be done uh, somewhat soon before we have our follow-ups. 
Another thing is our initial three tissue classification, the segmentation of gray matter, white matter, and CSF. This was from an algorithm that was trained on healthy adult males, but in reality, Alzheimer's disease is a disease of the elderly. So not a healthy adult male, but also tends to be more female than male. So this, this segmentation algorithm may not be ideal, um, but luckily we have a backup segmentation with the slant algorithm and we can do some other fancy stuff to kind of address it. And perhaps the most interesting one is that we use a material model of the brain to calculate stress, but everyone knows that all material models of the brain are wrong. So our hope is just that some of them can be useful. So if you don't believe me that all of them are wrong, there is a really nice publication in 2021 that looked at all of the different literature that have quantified the brain material properties. And they kind of said across different studies, how do they vary? And even per patient, how do they vary? And so the one I have up top here in red is looking at how the corpus callosum is quantified. Just across, if you look even across these two porcine studies using two different methods, they predict 10 times different material constants for the identical region. So like this is all to say that even if you could have the ideal material model to describe the brain type, you know, which is this really porous, elastic, viscous material, super soft and has blood vessels all the way through it. Even if you could get that material model, trying to get the constants to fill in that material model is already non-trivial. So we have to know that this, there's major limitations to all these studies. But if you wanted to drive down even more into the material models and get as close as possible, instead of using the hyperelastic isotropic uh, material model that we use, we can actually account for some of the fibers. So if you haven't seen it, this is a tractogram that looks at all the individual white matter tracts throughout your brain and quantifies them in their exact orientations in you per patient. And you could theoretically use these in different material models, like a fiber reinforced model, such as these two. And then you could have this isotropic term and then also this anisotropic term, and then you can get the contributions of each of these. But even then still, these fibers are ultra soft. They only act in tension. And so like trying to do this very complicated material model isn't always worth it, um, but just something cool to see that you can actually quantify this as well. So I won't go over it too much again, but we developed this pipeline from MRI all the way to patient specific biomechanics. We got these 133 different brain regions where we can stratify all the biomechanical quantities. And even though we had some limitations, we think that this initial methods should hopefully be enough when we get our actual patients to kind of draw some conclusions. And so now we're eagerly gathering our two-year study patients, trying to currently scan our baseline for these elderly subjects so they can track their cognitive behavior, their biomechanical changes, and then also their lesion burden over time. So yeah, we're really excited to get that going. And we hope that we can hopefully get all these baseline study studies done before I leave which will hopefully be sometime in December of this year. So with that, I think that is my last slide if it progresses here. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank a lot of really important people, especially my lab members who are shown uh, past and previous members on the left here. And then also some really important advisors, Yuji Tong, Eric Nauman, Javed, who is a postdoc, and Dr. Mehmet Kurt at the University of Washington. And then also research help for all the work they've done too for putting this together. So yeah, I'd like to take any questions if you guys have them. Howard, so I have a question about the um, machine learning algorithms used to kind of like, if I understood correctly, basically like designate like what, what part of the brain you're in at any given time when you're looking at this data. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned um, basically like the first version that you used was optimized on healthy adult males and that might not be relevant for like the, like, I guess like elderly male population that you could use it on um, for your guys' data. Like, uh, I have no idea how specific, like, these algorithms are to, like, the patient populations they're designed for. Like, can you still, like, how different is it? Is it really different or, like, 2% different? Curious. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So two things on that. The first tissue classification algorithm was not machine learning. I think they used some kind of feature space, but I don't think it was, like, a formal machine learning algorithm, whereas this slant one actually was. But in terms of how different the brains can be, like the brain degrades at that like 0.25% brain volume per year. And so if you compound that over a lifetime, when you look at these Alzheimer's patient brains, it's, they're like visibly two to three X different. Like most of the brain, if you look at it in these really bad cases is full of fluid as opposed to being full of fluid volume or as opposed to being full of like tissue volume. So like the amount, the proportions of the material types is dramatically different and they're like very visibly different for sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you.
Yeah, great question. Yeah, any other questions? Hey, Tyler, um, I have kind of like a lateral question. So basically, I, I also worked in a kind of like a MRI department at, at Siemens. And so when, when I was there, they were working on some, some phantoms to use in, in the MRI machines. And something really difficult to get was exactly like, you know, a material that could resemble the one of the brain. So something that I was thinking is like this amazing segmentation that you created with like, you know, this, all the different labels, could it be potentially used to create some really detailed models of the brain that could be used as phantoms for like, you know, uh, surgical training, for example, then I'm pretty sure it's not that easy as in other, you know, uh, you know, parts of the body. So maybe that could be something that could be, you know, kind of like used coming out of this research. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic question. Like I could see a couple things, like number one, the easy one would be 3D printing each of these individual parts, because the segmentation algorithm they developed is it kind of already puts them into these separate objects. So it becomes almost trivial to print them individually and then kind of stick them together. So for an anatomical demonstration purpose, definitely you could make it a, a pull apart model really easily. But it, like in terms of a, a phantom, it'd be very difficult, I think, to get the material properties correct for each of these different regions. Cause they typically vary like, you know, 10 to hundred percent per region. So yeah, it's kind of tricky. And then like, if you go for the MRI, there's also like the, the signal property differences where you have to kind of like be very careful about what materials you're putting in the, the, the actual object you're going to scan. So you could probably do it. And it depends on the study you want to conduct, I think, but it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't, I'd imagined that basically, you know, there would have been, it would have been pretty hard. I mean, I, when I tried to do it, I tried to segment it in like, you know, four or five different elements and it was already challenging to do so. So, uh, yeah, thanks for, for, for asking me. Yeah, it's a great question. The manual segmentation is brutal. I've done it. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Any other questions? Malik, do you want to go ahead? Hi, I'll, I'll try to be the clinical devil side of okay here. <laughs> awesome. So question on, uh, so I, I really like your project, um, uh, and Thanks. you know, like, uh, the way how you're, you're approaching about like, you know, diagnosing it sooner is really great. Uh, do you guys have any plan of, you know, like, um, let me take a step back. Like, so neuro in general, in the clinic, you know, is one of those branches where the physical exam still is very, very relevant. Uh, meaning like, you know, they do a full neuro exam for not only like the motor function, the sensory function, but also memory. Uh, you know, and uh, also how uh, they are interpreting what people are saying and stuff like that. There's like this whole checklist. Uh, do you guys have any plan of like the subjects that you're going to include in this MRI study to also include like their clinical tests or evaluations and somehow combine the two or in future? Yeah, it's a great point. I don't think I had it on the slide and I'll have to double check it with our clinical collaborator. But I think the one they mentioned was the mini mental state exam. Because definitely we should be clarifying their mental state for sure. Great. That would be good. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. Pat, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, so I have kind of like a health implication question. Like in theory, if like the consistency of like your blood vessels impacts, uh, like the likelihood you develop Alzheimer's in the future, like what can you do to help maintain like flexible, you know, a vasculature. Yeah, it's a great question. I have a slide somewhere on this. I won't dig it up for you, but there's a couple of things you can do. Number one is exercise, healthy exercise in cardiovascular, uh, specifically aerobic exercise is known to kind of like mediate the stiffening of the arteries. There's a lot of other ones too, like lifestyle changes. I think stress was one. I think sleep was one for lymphatic clearance. They're, and they're mainly like non-pharmaceutical from what I understand, like lifestyle changes primarily and, and diet, of course, is another good one. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I didn't talk too much about it, Pat, but the glymphatic system is super interesting. It's one of like the, the micro scale kind of clearance system of how you actually move these solutes out of the brain. And that's affected a lot by your sleep quality, which is like shown to be not so great in a lot of people. Um, but yeah, easy to change. Yeah, one thing I was thinking, like just looking at that image is like, uh, it's like shocking how much more like blood flow there is like around your brainstem compared to like your, um, you know, like prefrontal cortex. Um, so yeah. like, do you just clear more lymph fluid? 
you know, from that portion of your brain, they have like different like waste output. So you know, we're, my, yeah, my understanding of it is that it's actually the larger scale arteries. If I could play here. I, so I think like where this is really moving around quite a bit is actually near the circle of Willis. And that's like the large circular kind of branching of the larger arteries. Like your, I think it's your, oh, I'll forget my advisor. <laughs> Not like this, but like the vertebrals, the basilar carotids, these larger arteries that actually have the majority of the brain fluid as it's coming into the brain. It's these larger arteries that I think cause the motion. So in terms of the clearance, that typically happens at like capillary scale or arteriolar scale, where you have this finer grain motion. And there's a lot of debate about what actually drives the clearance at that like very tiny scale. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, any other questions? Joaquim, do you want to go ahead? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, sounds great. Cool. Uh, I put a question in the chat. Uh, and uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all the focus, I guess, it took for you to to do this stuff. And then uh, I, I'm going to settle this question. Uh, if I would have put this paper into a future version of chat GPT and asked it to summarize the abstract and the result of it to be understandable to laymen, and also speculate about future usability of the research, what would chat GPT tell me? And limit the answer to four tweets and take into account the stuff in the paper that is not in the abstract and result also. It's a great question. <laughs> Love this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best here. I'll be counting your tears, Tyler. You can, okay. perfect, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I guess to, to do the layman summary first, the idea is, let's see if I can get this right here. The health of your arteries in middle life, like ages 45 to 60, really impacts the way your brain ages over the next 20 years of your life. And so if you have unhealthy arteries, unhealthy diet, and therefore altered brain motion, it may actually affect the way your brain degrades over time. And it's not very well known how this occurs but we could quantify it using the methods developed in this paper. And so the future usability is that if these methods actually do turn out to predict Alzheimer's really well, then hopefully we can make it to the clinic where we could have part of a, you know, a, a screening where you could do these baseline scans and then follow up a couple of years from them and see if there's any of the metrics that I'm describing uh, in your case. And then if there are, we have to do something about it on the clinical scale. Maybe then you have clinicians who start to develop therapeutics or treatments now that we can detect it a little earlier. So we're kind of trying to provide that like window of, of opportunity where people could even develop therapeutics. I think I went over four tweets, but we'll let it go. Claps. Great question. <laughs> so the uh, uh, follow-up question, how much does a screening like this uh, cost today? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think the CNA, maybe Malik could correct me, but I don't think the CNA scan is used very often in the clinic. And to get an idea of like the cost of an MRI, I think it's about 600 to $700 an hour, at least for a research MRI. So I'm not sure how that varies for the clinic. Malik, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I would just add to that a little bit. So that's a good question about the cost. Uh, like for current, like, you know, standards, if we end up like, you know, screening pretty much everybody that would add to a lot of cost, depending on person's insurance. Um, like I, I, the research one that you guys have sounds actually like cheap to me, but depending on the insurance, MRI, along with the radiologist report can cost anywhere from north of thousand dollars to even a couple grand, depending on what type if or at, at all you're doing it with and without, uh, you know, uh, uh, contrast and stuff. So, um, the. The screening, if we start, uh, you know, this is all much later, but if we start, there has to be like at least certain parameters defined if there are risk factors like family history, or if there are um, other concerns about if, oh, they already have peripheral vascular disease, so they likely have something going on with the vessels in the brain and so on and so forth. Um, but it's, it's can definitely end up being a little costly endeavor uh, if going current rates, yeah. 
Yeah, those are great points. Any other questions? No? Okay, Joaquin, do you want to go again? Yeah, I just want to ask, is this paper open access? It's actually not published yet. We're still waiting on a little bit of data to kind of finalize this and a couple small changes, um, but I hope that it will be. That's the plan. Awesome. Definitely will be on Research Hub when I get it, though, so watch out for a summary <laughs> or something. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Any last questions? I think your hand is still up, Joaquin. If you had another question, feel free. No? Okay. All right. No worries. Yeah, this is great. Thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate the questions and the attention. Cool. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Malik. And I appreciate the clarifications too. See you guys. Have a good night. Thank you.